Good morning, and my name is Melinda Moulton, and I'm the host of Moments with Melinda. And today, I mean, I am just so excited because I get to talk with my dear friend, Senator Peter Welsh. How are you, Senator? Well, you're my dear friend too, Melinda. We've known each other for decades. It's really, and I'm so, you know, so admire all your energy, all you've done, especially for women and all you've done for uh, uh, not just politically and on choice where you have been an extraordinary voice uh, sharing your own personal story, uh, but on, uh, on, on jobs like in construction. I mean, it's everything. And thank uh, thank you. Thank you. But this, today, this is about you. So let me tell my viewers a little bit about you, um, although most people know you. Senator Peter Francis Welsh is an American lawyer and politician serving since 2023 as the junior United States Senator from Vermont. Senator Welsh was a U.S. Representative for Vermont in Congress from 2007 to 2023 and has been a major figure in Vermont politics for over 40 years. Peter is only the second Democrat to be elected a senator from the state of Vermont. Is that about correct? That's right. But our first one is the wonderful Patrick Leahy, who may have been the first, but he lasted the longest, <laughs> 48 years. Pretty amazing career he had. And bless his beautiful heart and Marcel, too. So, Peter, you and I, I just want to share a little tidbit because you and I were born on the same day. No, yeah. I didn't know that. That's cool. Yes, but I, you're, you're a few years older than I am. Now, let's let's talk about your childhood. You were born in Springfield, Massachusetts. So right. talk to us a little bit about growing up. You know, I grew, Springfield, Mass was, uh, was a good city uh, when I was growing up. It was called the City of Homes. Uh, it had a lot of ethnic neighborhoods. I lived on kind of a multi-ethnic street, although we were pretty separated. Multi-ethnic means Jews and Catholics and Protestants, uh, but there was still significant segregation in Springfield. Uh, and when I grew up, uh, I grew up in an Irish Catholic family. Uh, when people asked you where you were from, you didn't say the city, you didn't say Springfield, you said what parish. So I was from Holy Name Parish and uh, I had friends you know, as they started playing basketball and getting a lot more cosmopolitan. I got to know people uh, from Our Lady of Sacred Heart, from Cathedral, from uh, Holy Cross, uh, from Immaculate Conception. So it was that kind of city. But, um, you know, you could I, we, we could walk to school, ride our bike, go to the park. Um, and uh, I grew up in a family with the mom and dad and, and uh, th three brothers and two sisters. So we had a big Irish Catholic family. Um, so who would you say had the greatest influence on the course and trajectory of your life? Well, my mother and father, uh, for sure. I mean, just in terms of the values, you know, my mother was, uh, uh, she, we had a competition, not a competition, uh, six kids. So when we would be talking and somebody would ask the question, who did your mother, you know, love the best? Um, every single one of us would answer it was us. It was me. And we believed it. Okay, every single one of us. So my mother just had this, I think, enormous capacity for love and security. And, um, you know, the thing that I take from her, uh, she was a very accepting person. She was a practicing Catholic, uh, but she, she was not judgmental. So that was, she had her faith and she abided by her rules. Uh, but if someone else had a different point of view, um, she had a capacity to be accepting. You know, one of the things I so remember about my mom that I so uh, kind of admired, uh, she w was a practicing Catholic and against abortion. And we, and when I was growing up, I before I even knew what abortion was, we had a person across the street who actually performed abortions, and it was a crime, and went to jail for a couple of months. I didn't know what I was doing. We'd have dinner every night. Um, three days a week, my mother would send me across the street to that family to uh, bring them dinner, right? And at the time, I didn't even know it. And it, it, so even though she was opposed to it, she wanted to help that family. And uh, I find I, it's, a, it's a memory I have of her that's pretty special because she had that capacity just to cross uh, everybody she ran into. So it was... It was really quite nice. My father was a dentist and uh, a very generous person. 
Uh, <laughs> he gave a lot of free care to the nuns. Uh, he, he couldn't charge them. Uh, uh, but I remember him always, uh, when we go to the beach in the summer, he'd drive me home to go to Little League and play play baseball. And I remember him taking me out of my donut route. And on Wednesdays, uh, uh, he was he took Wednesdays off and worked on Saturdays. And I, I have lots of fond memories of doing errands with him when I was a little boy. Uh, making the rounds for Wednesday errands. And to this day, I love personally uh, doing errands. I, uh, you know, when I'm home, uh, as a matter of fact, I just came back from doing that. I went to the grocery store. I went to the farm stand. I went to the hardware store. I went to the post office. And just those activities, you know, the daily activities of um, doing what you have to do and running into people. And uh, I just love it. And that's a fond memory I have of doing those things with my dad. It's beautiful. Well, I, now I understand where you get your beautiful big heart. So now, Peter, you worked with low-income people on Chicago's West Side during the tumultuous yet remarkable transformational 60s era, and you were a community organizer. Talk to us a little bit about that, and I'll bet you probably remember the 68th convention. I do. I was there, I was, but I was on the outside. This time I'll be on the inside. Um, and uh, I was out there uh, smelling the gas, uh, uh, the tear gas that uh, the, the Chicago police were firing in all directions at the demonstrators. Of course, to just tell you a little bit about my work in Chicago, I was at, uh, I was in college, and you know one of the vivid memories I have in high school actually, um, and it, you know it's hard for people who are younger, and that's most people, but. Uh, we had a teacher who took four of us down to Florida. Uh, we took a road trip from Springfield down to Florida. And I remember stopping at a gas station in Georgia. Um, and I was really quite shocked to see uh, whites only and a sign that said colored people, right? And, you know, I had no idea what that was because uh, I was uh, – that, that I just wasn't in the segregated South. I, there was a lot of segregation in the North that I was, I'm sure at that point, blind to. But to see it so explicit and so legal and so sanctioned, I remember how stunning that was. And then, of course, in the 60s, there was all of that enormous, uh, wonderful leadership um, in the South uh, by Martin Luther King and Ralph Abernathy and the Freedom Riders, some you know the white kids who... Uh, came from the north and uh, were trying to uh, get the right uh, to vote, trying to help uh, black Americans in the south get the right to vote. And that really captured my attention. And when I was at uh, um, Holy Cross is where I went to college, I learned about a summer project that was going to be doing community organizing in the west side of Chicago, which was a very poor neighborhood. So on the 4th of July weekend, of uh, 1967, I hitchhiked out to Chicago and uh, met, met with some of my friends from Holy Cross College who were in the project. And uh, within, with, within, a, uh, within a few, a 24 hours, my mother's worst fear came true because we took some, uh, the, the city wasn't picking up the trash in the neighborhood. So we brought the trash down to City Hall and dumped it there. And uh, uh, you know, what was so astonishing was that the next day there was a caravan of city sanitation trucks uh, picking up the trash in Chicago. And we had organized that. I, actually, I was along for the ride at that point, but my co my my friends and the neighborhood people organized that. And it gave me the first sense of the power of working together. Uh, by the end of the summer, uh, we had gotten aware of the systemic housing discrimination that caused so much suffering in the black neighborhood, people couldn't buy a house uh, on a mortgage. Uh, they had to get it on what was called a contract. So the typical situation would be uh, a real estate speculator would scare a white family saying the blacks are coming. They buy the house for X. Two days later, they sell it on contract to the black family for two X, literally to double the price the family couldn't get a mortgage. So instead of paying 5% interest, they'd pay 7%. And under the terms of the contract, if you were there eight or nine years and missed a payment, you could be th you were thrown out, okay? It was like buying a TV on time. And uh, 
so I decided to stay on because we became aware through our research and talking to the neighbors uh, and community members about this. And we eventually created what was called the Contract Buyers League. So I dropped out of college my, my junior year and stayed there to work on this. And uh, that went on, <clears throat> that organization uh, actually thrived. And ultimately, we did things like pick at the banks about demanding that they start writing mortgages to qualified families in the black neighborhood, demanded that they end, end the, the redlining. We picketed the, the, the Veterans Administration, the FHA, which wouldn't give a black World War II veteran a, a mortgage, even though a white veteran would get it. Uh, we got a major, a major law firm, Jenner and Black, <clears throat> uh, to represent us in trying to overturn the constitutionality of the, the contract law, which was called the Forcible Entry and Detainer Act, where you'd lose all your equity after 10 years if you missed a single payment. Um, and we uh, went on a rent strike where we put people's payments in escrow. And uh, uh, so we fought hard uh, and ultimately uh, were successful in renegotiating we were successful in getting banks to start giving loans, the FHA to rescind its policy. Uh, we got the law changed uh, in court uh, so people would have equity. And, uh, uh, and, and we also were able to renegotiate a lot of these extortionate contracts and get people on regular mortgages, and it saved a lot of money. <clears throat> so um, in this, of course, in that very poor neighborhood, these were the folks who were the ones who were really invested, like in the schools uh, and the well-being of their kids and, and being community leaders and participants. But um, that's what I think got me interested uh, both in politics and in law, because what I saw there and I still see today is that some of the worst things that happen in society, uh, they're illegal. You know, it's not just the illegal stuff that's so terrible, but it was actually legal for these white speculators to rip off black families. The law empowered them to do it. Just like in the South, it was legal if you went into a public accommodation to tell blacks they couldn't come. You could do that, all right? So I was shocked at how things that were really bad were totally legal. So uh, two things. One is I saw the power of organizing and collective action. Uh, and number two, um, I, I saw uh, how the law could be really discriminatory. So I think it got me interested in politics and law, because obviously if you're in politics, you can try to change the laws. And if you're a lawyer, you can try to fight bad laws. Right. So now, Peter, you served in Vermont Senate during a time when the Democrats gained control of the Senate after over a 100 year uh, beginning in the 1830s that Republicans controlled the Vermont legislature. We've really never looked back. Talk to us a little bit about that time. You know, I ran, uh, I, 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 I ran for uh, state Senate in Windsor County in 1980. I'd been here six years after law school, and it was the year of the Reagan landslide in Windsor County, and I think in this whole history had only one Democrat. Um, but it was a three-member race, a, th a three th three-member district. So uh, the insight I had was that if I could get somebody to give me one of their three votes, I didn't have to be their first choice. I could be their second or third, and that was fine with me. Um, and uh, we ran a campaign where uh, I had a theory that if you did really well in the very rural parts of a rural county. Um, where it's hard to get people to trust you. You know, they really kick the tires. They, 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 they're careful um, that I could, I could win. And um, one of the things we did was to find folks in all of the towns. Uh, and then if they were willing to support me, we'd go over the checklist and they would send a postcard out uh, to everybody they knew saying, hey, you've got three votes next week. Peter Welch, I think, is good, and I hope you'll consider him. And we became the top vote getter. So we won in a, in a huge victory, uh, in a huge Republican wave. Um, and then, you know, I got to say, going into that Senate, when I was a, I was a Democrat in, in sort of a, you know, a, 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 
uh, what am I doing here kind of question is what I could face from a lot of the Republican uh, elders. I, I was treated with such respect by by uh, people like Bob Gannett and Art Gibb, uh, these longtime Republicans, and they asked me what committee I wanted to be on, and I said finance, which is a big deal uh, when you're starting out. And all of a sudden, I realized, wait a minute, I can't just be a rabble rouser here. I got to try to contribute. They have given me a seat at the table, and that uh, that courtesy that we have in Vermont, and the, you know, fighting always to hang on to that mutual respect that you want to have in life as well as politics. I really got. I was the beneficiary of that when I first went to the state Senate. So, you know, I loved being in the state Senate and having a voice and being involved in the public policy questions in Vermont. But that Vermont ethic of consideration, of listening to people you disagree with, of trying to find some common ground, that was all there at the, in the Vermont Senate when I arrived. And that that attitude was something that allowed me to have a very good experience there. So then fast forward four years when I became the first Democrat to be the Senate leader, um, I, continue, I started the tradition or continued that I can't remember of appointing Republicans to chair committees. And it's funny, uh, Melinda, because in Washington, and when I tell people that I did that and we did that here in Vermont, they literally think I need a mental status exam because you know you, you don't deal with the other party, but that's not how we do it in Vermont. It's not how we do it. So to my viewers, I just want to let you know that in 2006, when Bernie ran for the Senate, that's when Peter ran for his seat and he won. And you were only the second Democrat since 1853 to take that seat. And then from that point on, you've dominated the political landscape in Vermont with huge popularity. Uh, often exceeding 67% of that support. You have been called the nicest dude uh, in D.C. by John Fetterman, the senator from Pennsylvania. And I agree that you are one of the kindest and friendliest people, but to garner that accolade is not easy. How do you attribute this to your service, the nicest dude in Washington? Well, you know, it's a low bar in Washington, okay? So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not getting a big, a big, uh, big head about it. Um, but, you know, it, in a way, it's like my mom, right? So I have strong views and strong convictions. And, you know, I just did something that was, uh, I, you know, I was one of the first to I voted against the aid to uh, Israel with their war in Gaza. I uh, wrote a letter uh, being the first senator to suggest to President Biden that he not run again, which was very, very hard. So, you know, it, it's important for all of us in political life to have strong convictions and to act on them. But you can do that by being uh, respectful of other people and by not indicting them because you disagree. And I actually do take that back to my mother. It just was never important to tell somebody why they're stupid or why they're wrong. That was just not what life was about. Um, it was about, uh, you know, I saw with my mother how she had a very rich life emotionally with people because they trusted her, they confided in her. And I saw what joy it gave to her. And I think a lot of that was because, well, she was a woman of enormous conviction. Um, she was, um, acceptance was like, as opposed to judgment was the way she approached people. So in Washington, you know, I'm not going to persuade Ted Cruz uh, that he's wrong about Trump or even that he's He's said, why are you acting this way? Uh, but on the other hand, and I don't have to, because that's not why I'm there. I'm, at, I'm there to represent Vermont. Okay, that's my job. So uh, just as an example, at, at a point where this Congress was being criticized for only passing 26 bills, one of the 26 was a bill that I co-sponsored with Ted Cruz and was signed by President Biden. So my approach on things in politics is to try to work with anybody who is willing to work with me on something that we agree on uh, and sort of uh, not uh, focus on where we disagree. The nicest dude in Washington. So let's let's head into the present moment. Can you just talk to us a little bit about the remarkable Harris Walls ticket and your thoughts <laughs> as to why it, I mean, 
why it has so energized the American public. Well, you know, um, it's so astonishing because, you know, just think of what's happened in the past month. The president had that debate, uh, which we all know was a catastrophe for the campaign. Then there was the question that everybody was struggling with. Should he step aside? And that was a huge question because no president has ever done that this far close to the election. Uh, the only one before was LBJ, and he was in significant primaries. This is a case where President Biden had won the nomination. But the things that were, there were two things at work. One is, uh, should he, uh, where he had won it, and where he had enormous support from people like me for the job he'd done, and also that he defeated Trump, uh, but had real questions about his ability to win, uh, given um, that debate and what it showed. But then the holdback for a lot of people was, well, what happens if he's replaced? So you had the fear of uh, a change, which was dealing with the unknown, or you had the fear of proceeding with the president where you knew it was a lot of trouble. And that fear of the unknown vanished. Once the president uh, made his decision, it's as though this pressure cooker, the lid was removed and all this pent up energy to try to push back on Trump and go from the politics of gloom and doom to the politics, as Tim Walls put it, of joy, <clears throat> it exploded. And the memes returned, you know, it, we're, we're in a brat summer and, uh, you know, none of us fell out of a coconut tree just the other day. <clears throat> and, and, every, uh, and everybody's and, pulling out their pussy hats. <laughs> That's right. And, and, and the vice president has had an opportunity to just demonstrate the extraordinary range of skills that she has. So, you know, I was one of the people who said we should have an open process if the president steps aside. You know what? We had an open process. It was just very quick. Right. You mean uh, the vice president raised one hundred million dollars in, in a couple of a day and a half or something. 150,000 volunteers signed up, and everybody whose name was mentioned as a possible candidate endorsed her. So this was a bottom-up uh, coronation, if you want to call it that. The best so one. now we're off and running, and I, you know, I just haven't seen this kind of excitement, Melinda, uh, since Obama, really. Absolutely. So, so Peter, um, Senator Welsh, you were a man of passion and purpose, mm -hmm. and you stand for so many of the issues that many Americans stand for. Gun control. <laughs> LGBTQ rights, reproductive rights, and you were one of the first to call for a ceasefire in the Israeli-Hamas war. But one of your signature fights is the one for our democracy. What is on the line here? Well, our democracy is on the line. I mean, uh, uh, and Trump is autocratic. Uh, and keep in mind, somehow this gets abstracted. He did convene the mob on J January 6th, which attacked the Capitol. Five people were killed. Uh, directly and indirectly. Uh, and I was in the Capitol that day. I was in the gallery, probably the most dangerous place because we were the most confined. <clears throat> I was 30 feet from where the shot was fired and Ashley Babbitt uh, was killed as she was trying to break in uh, to the speaker's lobby. Um, and what I remember about that was that as scary as it was, and I was up there when the mob was in the process of breaking the glass on the doors that come into uh, the, the the House of Representatives is that door that everybody sees when uh, the the uh, the clerk says, uh, the, "Mr. Speaker or Miss Speaker, uh, the President of the United States," and the President comes in for the uh, State of the Union address. Well, th those doors were being smashed, and uh, there were guards in the bottom who had their guns out, and we didn't know what was going to happen. But what I remember, Melinda. It was so surreal is that even though I was there, even though I heard the shot, even though I saw the glass being shattered, even though I saw uh, the security staff with their guns out, I didn't believe it was happening. This is the United States of America. We have a peaceful transfer of power. This can't be happening here because that's not who we are as a country, but it was happening. <clears throat> and uh, of course, we're seeing the election denialism continue from uh, former President Trump, and that's a big part of his campaign. Uh, he, he's not uh, making any pledge to adhere to it. And then, of course, this Project 2025 that we're all hearing about, that's real. 
So, you know, but the, the Trump campaign is m- making very clear is that they're not going to waste any time uh, doing everything they can in the courts, uh, in the executive, uh, and in Congress. Also, they've got a lot of supporters in Congress right now that are real MAGA folks. That was unlike the uh, Republicans that I first worked with when I went to Congress in 2007. So uh, this democracy uh, is very much uh, in play here. And do you want to have an autocrat or do you want to have a a person, small d Democrat, that is leading leading our country? So big question for the people. So to my viewers, to learn more about Senator Welsh's positions on issues, I, I please visit his website at www.welsh.senate.gov. Um, so I was going to talk to you about ensuring that voters' uh, voices are being heard, uh, because I know that there's a lot of stuff going on, but I have some other things I want to talk to you about. Um, I want to talk to you about climate change. Uh, we just had, in the last couple of days, in the last couple of years, um, but in particular, uh, just very recently, climate change is what I believe to be the greatest threat to our human existence. And I know that folks like Bill McKibben and Paul Hawken hold hope, but how can our country shape the future of climate? Because even here in Vermont, humans are feeling and experiencing the devastation. Well, number one, I think it is the existential issue of our time, okay? And it's been heartbreaking to meet Melinda uh, because you know a year ago, well, first 2011, we had Irene, which was devastating, over a billion dollars worth of damage. <clears throat> a year ago, in July, uh, Montpelier, among other cities, they were underwater. And, uh, and uh, you know, I visited the cities like Hardwick and Lindenville uh, and Londonderry and Weston <clears throat> and Barrie. Um, and what is so heartbreaking is a lot of farms were really destroyed. The, co- the crops were just coming in and they got swamped. Uh, businesses were wiped out. Uh, and the, really the huge heartache is, is homes were, were devastated. And then uh, this July in Barrie, I went back and they had another flood. And people who were just getting back on their feet in their homes suddenly were flooded again. And then, you know, 10 days after that, we had another flood up at like in Lindenville and in Plainfield and folks got wiped out there. And these are places that have never been flooded. OK, so you're getting a total change in the weather where you might get this rainstorm that looks benign. But with the weather pattern, it just sits over your house and you could be in Hardwick, you could be in Lindenville, you could be in Kirby, you can be in a place where you haven't had this challenge. But it's like lightning strikes. It decides to settle over your house and dump 11 inches of rain. Water comes down off the hills into the stream, and the stream is a raging river. The river changes course and comes over and takes your house away. So that's real. And that means we've really got to reduce carbon emissions. So uh, that's the big challenge of our time. And uh, we did with the Inflation Reduction Act, which is the Infrastructure Act, for the first time commit major resources in public policy to the effort of reducing carbon emissions, moving to clean energy, uh, having more efficient appliances and and tighter houses. Obviously, you don't flip the switch and get rid of the carbon emissions and go back to the old days where we weren't messing with the climate. It's a long, continuous process. And the big challenge for us is to make that transition affordable. And affordable means it's got to get up to scale because you can't be asking Vermonters, you know, to buy an electric car if they can't afford it. They're too expensive, right? Um, You can't ask them to build a house according to certain code specifications if it's not affordable and it's not affordable already. So I think our big challenge is implementation. You know, we got started and I think you're seeing the market take up the opportunities that are there by moving to clean energy technologies but we've got to get it to scale. So it's actually affordable for everyday Vermonters whose job in the, in, is to raise their family, is to show up at work and do a good job. It's not to figure out um, the best EV battery. <clears throat> so that's where public policy, I think, has been really good to help provide incentives for some of our companies to get engaged in the opportunities that are there uh, by moving to clean energy. But we have to 
understand that it's got to be affordable uh, for everyday folks who are struggling to pay their bills. And the Vermont legislature, <clears throat> our electric companies need to continue on with the subsidies which have been cut since I put in my solar panels 10 years ago, but that's right. another subject. So I have three more questions for you, Senator. The Supreme Court has just gifted the president immunity. That is true for President Biden and whomever else is elected in November. Your thoughts? It's bizarre. The most important principle is that we are a, we are a, a country of laws, not men or women. Okay, the law applies to all of us, and that includes the president, includes the governor, <clears throat> includes the U.S. senator. None of us are above or beyond the reach of the law. So I, I'm truly shocked at the decision that a president has immunity basically by saying, in his opinion, what he was doing, going after your tax records to, uh, to uh, harass you, uh, or you know, ordering uh, the special forces uh, to assassinate somebody because the president claims that it was national security interest when it was a political rival. I mean, that's the implication of this immunity ruling. So it's a truly shocking thing. And I think uh, really it, it, it's one of the reasons why the court, the, the U.S. Supreme Court is such a discredited institution right now, Melinda. Absolutely. So um, let's focus just very quickly on the three top priorities and issues that you see facing Vermont right now. What are your top three? Well, I think affordability is huge. You know, people, you know, it, it, it's really, really, I think it's a scandal that you get somebody who gets out of high school, is trying to learn a good trade, and they can't afford to buy a house in Vermont. Or somebody who graduates from college, they get a, a quote, good job. They want to start a family, and the cost of child care is totally beyond reach. The uh, ability to buy a home, uh, is totally beyond reach. Those things that are so essential to getting started in life. So this, in in the cost of healthcare, uh, is 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 it is not sustainable. Okay. So the basic things that we all need, but particularly younger people need that first house or that first condominium, um, that uh, uh, that ability to go to work and have some security that your child is well taken care of and it's not going to bust the bank for you by the end of the month. These things are out of reach now. And, you know, that's not a red state, blue state deal, okay? I don't care what your politics are. You love your kids. I don't care what your politics are. You want to have a safe home, right, that's your own, if you can, or a good apartment. And that has to be within reach. You shouldn't have to have two jobs, uh, to be able to afford to pay the bills on the necessities. So I think that's a real crisis here in Vermont, and it is in many other parts, in most of the rest of the country as well. It's getting tougher in Vermont because I think our real estate market is two markets. You know, it's you get Vermont wages and you can't uh, compete with folks from uh, the big metropolitan areas who are buying a lot of our homes here. Well, we built our house in uh, 1974 with an FHA loan. It was a half a percent interest and it was $82 a month was our mortgage. Yeah, there you go. So we're coming to the end of my show, Senator Welsh. Um, what words of wisdom would you give our children as they face a future of innumerable challenges? Well, hang in. You know, this is, what, this is so much wonderful about Tim Walls. <clears throat> you know, it, 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 we, none of us pick the times we live in, right? Uh, and I think it is harder now than it was for me and it was for you, Melinda, when, when we were getting started. That half percent mortgage is not there. Um, so we've got to work to change things so that those things that made it possible for you and me to get a start are available to others. But there's also something internal that each of us has to kind of embrace, and that is how do you want to feel? How do you want to live your life? How do you want to face the problems that are not of your creation, but are ones that you have to contend with? And, you know, I, I think just getting up, facing the day, being good to other people, uh, having some confidence that it'll work out if you work hard. Uh, I think that's really important. And, you know, I, I do see uh, a real change in tone 
because it's been pretty gloomy uh, from my perspective uh, with the Trump kind of appeal to anger. You know, there's a lot of reasons to be angry, and there's a lot of legitimate uh, grievances that uh, President, former President Trump has spoken to and some of his supporters uh, uh, talk about as well. So let's respect that. But on the other hand, let's work in a way where it's about solving the problem, not blaming, uh, not, not the blame game. Uh, more acceptance and cooperation, less judgment and conflict. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Welsh, for your time today. What a delight to spend this half hour with you and to share your story with my viewers. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks. Thanks, and Melinda. Thank you. And yeah. to my viewers out there, I bye wish bye. you a beautiful day and I wish you a great moment in your day today. And thank you for joining me. Goodbye.